so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. Then you can check out our latest blog post, you can look at our latest podcast, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you go through this message, I pray that God works life change into your life, and welcome to Church on the Rock. Share with you tonight. Uh, I sort of uh, threw out a little teaser a couple of weeks ago uh, about a message that I wanted to do. I think it's kind of a fun message, but I do think it's very relevant. Um, it's called avoiding or how to avoid election infection. How to avoid election infection. And you know, I kind of looked around tonight and I said, "Well, we got you know a lot of teenagers here too that we're really glad to have." and you know, you may not be thinking anything about the election. You may not be old enough to vote yet, but don't go to sleep on me because the principles that I want to share with you tonight in this, they will help you not only in uh, an election debate, but they'll help you in any kind of debate. You know, you may be trying to elect a school president or uh, who's captain of the cheerleading squad or the football team, and people have different opinions, and that's kind of what this is about uh, tonight. Um, I want to just begin, let me, let me begin first of all with a scripture out of Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, listen to this scripture. It says, without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. I want to kind of begin with just a little survey. You don't have to take part in it, but uh, you're certainly free to. Just kind of slip your hands up. Um, as I ask you these questions, and just to kind of get a feel of where everybody's at with this thing of uh, elections, if you've been watching the news or television at all or any kind of social media, then you've come across this probably. But uh, how many have actually enjoyed the presidential debates and the caucuses and, and the, the uh, kind of backbiting and fighting nobody Nobody, I kind of have, I got to be, you know, it's kind of like a cage fight, you know, in suits and ties. And so, all right, all right, well, that gives me an idea then. Um, how many of you just can't wait for it to be over? You're just, wow, wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. How many of you can't stand when the subject of politics comes up around the table or at dinner parties or with your friends because it's like, oh, gosh, I know this is going to end in a fight. Somebody's, you know, got strong opinions about this. Good many of you. How many of you make sure you bring it up around the dinner table or anytime you, go, anytime you can? You can find a way to work it in any conversation. Okay, we're not real political. Um, anybody here who, who's saying... What debates you're talking about? Who's what? Who's running for president anyway? Is that anybody? You, you know, tick, tick. All right, I need to bring you up to speed, tick. Let you know who the candidates are. Um, how many have watched at least some of the debates? So, okay. All right. All right. Well, you get the idea then of what these debates have been about. Um. Now listen carefully to this one before you raise your hand. How many of you have already decided who you'll vote for? If that, if that person's the nominee, you already know who your person is. Raise your hand. You, you, you've picked it out. If the vote were tonight, I know who I would vote for. Wow, just about three or four. A lot of undecideds, huh? 
That's one thing that's amazed me about this election is, is the number of undecideds, the number of people that says, you know, I just don't know. I just don't know. I've got, you know, two or three that's still kind of in the battle and still looking at this thing. And <sighs> Who thinks that churches and preachers should just stay away from all this political stuff and we shouldn't even be talking about this? All right. Well, you two or three, bear with me because we're going to talk about it a little bit. So, <laughs> A little bit, but in a different context, a context I think that you will be able to get something out of. What I want to do tonight is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue you a challenge, a very serious challenge because this is a serious situation. This is a serious subject. The, the uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said without wise leadership, a nation falls. A nation falls. There's safety in having many advisors. So this is a serious subject. And here's the challenge. This is going to be really difficult for some of you, more difficult for some than others. But here's the challenge. I want you between now and November the 8th, which is election day, to very purposely, to very intentionally and deliberately say that I'm going to put my faith ahead of my politics. Just a simple, simple concept, but you make up your mind, I am going to put my faith ahead of my Politics. In other words, I'm going to be a Christ follower first and a Republican second. I'm going to be a Christ follower first and a Democrat second or a, a, a Libertarian or a Tea Party or Independent or whatever, whatever category you fall into. Would you be willing to place your faith values ahead of your political preference, no matter which side of the aisle you normally vote on? But Because, listen, if for no other reason, let, let me let you in on this, nobody goes to Washington, D.C. when they die. Right? There are things more important than your political viewpoints. Washington, D.C. is not where we end up. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of people on their deathbeds, both in as pastoring and working with hospice. I've had people ask me, Pastor, would you read me a portion of Scripture? I've had people ask, would you just read me the 23rd Psalm? That just brings me comfort. Pastor, would you pray with me? Sometimes a couple of days before they pass, sometime the day, sometimes just hours or minutes before they pass, would you just pray with me? I've even asked, had them ask me, would you sing a song to me? Which I usually say, you really don't want that to be the last thing you hear. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll take out my phone and I'll say, what's your favorite song? And they tell me and I'll just plug it in and I'll just play the song for them. But in all the time and all the people that I've dealt with on their dying beds, I've never had one person say, Pastor, could you just read a portion of the Constitution to me? Never once. Before I go, could you just, could you give me your take on the Bill of Rights? Never once have I had anybody ask me that. So as important as this is and as amped up as we can get about it, I think we all know that there are things more important than who lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue for the next few years. I'm not suggesting that we should not have opinions on this. I'm not even suggesting that we, sh we shouldn't sh share our opinions when appropriate. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we should all vote for any particular candidate or even any particular party. That would be a ridiculous thought. What I'm asking you to do as individuals is as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ just to put your faith ahead of your politics. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, I am so glad you're talking about this because I know there are so many people need to hear this. Not you, of course, but you're thinking, man, there's people need to hear this. 
In fact, many of you would probably say, Pastor, it's because of my faith that I'm a Republican. Don't you get it? It's because of my faith that I'm a Democrat. That's what leads me to be, to be here. And, and we even have scripture to back it up. I mean, you know, you, you, Republicans, you know how Republicans are, Republicans are considered on the right. You know, they're far right and, and the Democrats are far left. You know, that's kind of the way we, we see things. And so Republicans say, you know, we're, we're, we're on the right. In God always right? In Jesus always right? Of course I'm a Republican. God was a Republican. The Democrats are, they're in their corner saying, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, Jesus was a health care dispensing machine. Everywhere he went, he, he dispensed health care for free. People would flock to him to get free health care and free food. And how can you be a true Christ follower and not be a Democrat? Besides that, don't you remember Jesus said something about like rich people can't go to heaven because they're going to stick a needle in their eye or something like that? It's all there in the Bible. It's right there. My faith dictates my politics. And the truth is, no matter where you stand politically, you can find something in the Bible to support your political view. So in order to get this right... And I really believe, church, we have to get this right. I think the future of our nation depends on us getting this right. It's not enough for us to read what the Bible says about something. It's not enough for us to quote what the Bible says about it. It's not even enough for us to read or quote what Jesus says about something. In order to get this right, we're going to have to approach this thing the same way Jesus approached everything. Here's how Jesus approached everything. Jesus always put people first, politics second. Jesus always put people first, the law second. People first, the rules second. People first, public opinion second. He always put people first. And and Jesus knew that what was best for people is best. And really, that's our common ground here because while we can disagree about what's best for people, or we may disagree about who's best for the people, we cannot rationally disagree that what's best for the people is best, right? That much we have to agree on. What's best for the people is best, even if we can't decide who that is or what that is. We know by one of the most famous quotes uh, of Jesus in the Bible that Jesus always wanted to do what was best for the people. When the lawyers and the scribes and the Democrats and Republicans and all the people came and they gathered and they said, what is the greatest law? In other words, what is the most important thing? What's the most important issue? Is it health care? Is it illegal aliens? Is it, is it, is it uh, uh, pro-choice, pro-life? Is it health care? What's the most important law? What should guide our decision as to who we should follow? And Jesus gave that great debate answer. Uh, the, the, the greatest thing, he said, the greatest thing you could do is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Well, that's easy because all of our candidates say, and God bless America. And God bless America. You know, when we're running for office, we always want God. We want to invoke God because it's still politically correct to invoke God into our thing. So then Jesus, without missing a beat, without taking a breath, Jesus says, but the second greatest commandment or law or issue is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What's best for people is best. Jesus said on these two issues, you can hang all the other issues. Now just imagine if every person in America suddenly decided between now and November the 8th, I'm just going to love God with all my heart, all my mind, and all my soul, and I'm going to love my neighbor like I love myself. 
If everybody in America between now and election time made that decision, can I tell you it wouldn't make a dime's worth of difference who lived in the White House? It would be a moot issue. Now, is that, is that going to happen? Probably not. But let's sort of tease this out and how this may look in your life. You've heard me say this before. You may not change the world, but every one of us can change our world. We can change our family. We can change our workplace. We can change our school. We can change, we can change our churches. So think about this. Everything people do or, or everything people think makes perfect sense to them. That's what makes these debates so interesting. Both the debates that we watch between the candidates and the debates that people have around the coffee pot. We had a big debate about it this morning. The group of us guys that meet here on Wednesday morning, and we were talking about the different candidates. And, and the thing about it is everything people do and everything they say, it makes perfect sense to them. Everyone's political view makes perfect sense to them. We look at them and we say, how can you vote for him? How can you support her? I don't get it. But the truth is everyone's opinion makes sense to them. So, so when you don't know how someone can support such a candidate, when you don't know how somebody can support an idea like that, when, when you say, I don't know how anybody can call themselves a Christian and vote for them, when you don't know, it's because there's something you don't know. Think about that. I don't know how you can support them. You're right. It's because there's something you don't know. So one of the best things we can do when we find ourselves in this situation, when we hear someone that maybe, uh, maybe otherwise we really like them and respect them, but, but when we hear them talking about how they're going to vote, we just can't understand how or why. The best thing you can do is become a student, not a critic. Listen, you may learn something. You may find out how a person can be a Christ follower and still vote for this person. Be a student, not a critic. And if you think you have nothing left to learn, you have bigger problems than who's elected president. You have a heart problem, not a political problem. Okay, to really make this practical, when you find yourself in one of these politically charged conversations, when everybody's gathered around and everybody's talking about, no, this, no, we can't have this one, and no, this one's the one, and this one's one, I want to give you four simple questions that you can ask that may change the temperature in the room. It may change the flow of the room. You may only need one or two of these questions, or you may, you may can use all, all four of them. But I'm just going to give you four simple questions that I think you can ask, and, and I, I believe it can change the atmosphere, and I believe at the same time as an extra added benefit, you may actually learn something. The first question that you can ask when you're in a conversation with somebody with this is you can ask them, what led you to this decision? Can I ask you that? You're, you're, you're standing with this candidate, and, and this is what they believe, and this is what, what led you to that decision? Because when someone tells us, I'm voting for so-and-so, usually we're getting the last sentence in a long conversation. So tell me, what led, was it one issue in particular that they, they, they stand on? Was it one thing or, or two issues? Or, I mean, was it Donald Trump's hair? Was it what, you know, what, what led you to your decision? I just want to know what, you're, what you base that on. And what you've done, you've just invited someone to tell you at least part of their story. And here's what I know. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. And once I find out a person's story, 
I find it a lot more difficult to not like that person. I still may not agree with their decision or their politics, but at least I understand what led them to their decision. Somebody may start telling you, man, listen, I grew up poor. I grew up without having anything. I grew up having to depend on food stamps. I grew up having, and so I have to vote for somebody that's going to take care of the poor. I have to. That's my story. I said, oh, I get that. See, I've never had to use food stamps before. I just thought anybody used food stamps was just freeloaders. Wow, I get that. I understand that. May not change your opinion, but you hear their story. Second question you can ask is, have you always held that point of view? I mean, did you, has this been your guy from the start? Have you supported her? You to change your opinion. Was it the debates? You, you thought this was who you wanted, but you watched the debates and you thought, wow, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe this other guy's got a point here. Have you always held this or is this something? And if something did, what was it that, that changed your opinion? Now, this third one, this may sound a little sarcastic, but it's a great question to ask, especially when the issue moves from, a, from an issue to a personality. And it does. Politics is like anything else. It has a lot to do with personality. Well, I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they talk. I don't like their attitude. I just think that they're... they're arrogant or I think that they're this or I think and so when when the conversation goes there and 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 people begin to talk more about how uh, a, a, a personality is you need to first understand that the Bible warns us against gossiping and idle tongues and that does pertain to political season as well as other times Here's what the scripture says. Don't let one unholy word proceed out of your mouth, but speak only words that uplift and bring edification. Now that slows the conversation down right there. Don't let one unholy word proceed out of your mouth, but let only words that uplift and bring edification. So when the conversation begins to get way past the issues and get personal, a great question to ask is look at that person and say, oh, do you know him? Have you met him, really? And of course, they're going to say, well, no, I don't know him personally. And then you just say, oh, then don't say anything else. Just kind of let silence fill the room. You know Governor so-and-so? You, I mean, you, you said he's arrogant. You, you've met him? Well, no, I haven't met him. Oh, okay. And you should be quiet. And that kind of stops going down that road. Sometimes silence is golden. And then here's the real clincher. This one may bring the conversation to an end. But... When somebody has a really strong political view and they believe that everyone should agree with his or her views, then here's a great question to ask. Just look at them and say, you know, I get most of my information from the media. Where do you get yours? Where, where do you get your information? Oh, you too? Well, you know, that, that probably means we're both marginally informed. And we're probably both wrong, and it means most likely neither of us really know what we're talking about. So for us to create friction and conflict with friends and families based on marginal information and a biased media, it's absolutely foolish and absurd for, for us to argue and fight over it. And these questions can actually help just bring the temperature down in a room and help keep things in perspective. Uh, because people and, and should you have an opinion? Yes. Should you share that opinion when, when it's appropriate to do that in the right context? Absolutely. 
because you may teach somebody something, you may learn something. I think it's good to discuss that. Should we force our opinion at the risk of losing a friend or a relationship? Absolutely not. And let me tell you what else you lose. We lose influence. Let me explain what I mean by this. Every one of you have influence with somebody. It may be your children. It may be your friends. It may be people in your church. It may be people on your job. But you have influence with somebody. Somebody respects your opinion. They'll come to you and ask for advice on things. They'll do this. And, and, and listen, one of the great, the worst things you can do, never, never, never sacrifice your influence unnecessarily. Don't, don't give it up with your kids, your spouse, your friends, people at work. Never give up your Christian influence over a political issue. And let me tell you why. And I, I love this. In the United States of America... Guess what? Your opinion doesn't even count. It means nothing. It's, it's better than that because in the United States of America, do you know what counts? Your vote. You've got a vote. You've got a say. Your opinion doesn't mean anything. Why would you risk a friendship or a relationship over something that doesn't mean anything anyway? And you get to vote in a little closet that nobody knows how you vote. The vote is what counts. Why would we give up our influence over something that doesn't even matter when we can go vote our conscience and do something that will matter? How tragic to burn a bridge of influence that after the election and all the hoopla is open, over and you've jeopardized a relationship over something that doesn't even really matter, your opinion, you've lost someone's respect because you called them stupid for having an opinion other than yours, you, you've lost your, you're no longer the light of the world. You're no longer the salt of their earth. They're not going to come to you because you've lost, you've lost credibility with them. Never jeopardize a relationship over a political issue because what's best for people is what's best. And if we can get that right, we can gain more and more and more influence in the world. If we can just say what is best for people, and we may disagree on what's best. We may disagree on who's best, but if we keep that the focus, what is best for people? And I'm going to focus on loving God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and loving my neighbor like I love myself. And this is how we avoid election infection. It's going to be interesting from now to November the 8th. All the primaries have started and the caucuses have started and all of that. And it's interesting to watch. I, it's interesting for me to watch. Uh, I really do enjoy it. I really don't know who, if the election was tonight, I really don't know who I would vote for yet. There's one day I wake up thinking this is, this is my guy, and the next day I wake up thinking, you know, nah, I just really, so I really don't know. So I try to listen. I really do try to become a student, and I hear opinions that I think, I don't agree with that. I hear opinions that I think that's a good point. I think that Christians, Christ followers, should be the greatest students in the world instead of the biggest critics. We're so quick to criticize what we don't understand. So it goes back to what we talked about Sunday. Be willing to take that long walk around and at least look at it from that other person's point of view because you just might learn something. There's something that they can see that you can't. It may or may not change your opinion, but at least be willing to look at it so you can make an educated vote when you vote. Amen? Amen. Again, we're so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message encouraged you in any way, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org and let us know about it. Those type of messages encourage us as we work throughout the week. 
While you're there, check out our latest podcast or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a blessed week.